Okay, welcome back to Biology 100. Today we're going to talk about critical thinking in science and evaluating scientific claims. So today's lecture is actually divided into three parts. We're going to have a recap of the scientific method. We're also going to talk about where we publish scientific findings. And finally, we're going to talk about evaluating scientific claims and how to use critical thinking to determine whether something is kosher or not. Okay, so just to recap uh, what we talked about last time. We said the scientific method has about six or seven steps. We start with an observation, for example, observing that our car wouldn't start. We come up with a question, the question being why doesn't the car start? And then we formulate a hypothesis. We say, well, we think the car's not starting because my battery is dead. We then begin to conduct an experiment to test that hypothesis. We replace the battery, we steal a battery from your friend, and then we test that uh, result. By turning the key, if now the car starts, we can say for sure that it was the battery that caused my car not to start. On the other hand, if my car still doesn't start, we can reject the hypothesis and say it wasn't the battery, I need to go on somewhere else. Now, let's talk about where we go from here. Now, obviously, if you're just troubleshooting your car, you're not going to publish a scientific paper about it. But on the other hand, if you're doing a study to determine whether or not, let's say, ginkgo biloba helps with memory, and you find some positive or negative results, you might want to publish those. And where you're going to publish those is in scientific literature. So scientific literature is a little bit different than everyday sort of popular literature in a few ways. First of all, we call it primary literature. And that's because that's where we publish the primary findings. That's where they're first uh, announced or published is in the primary literature. And these are in what we call journals. And most of these journals are peer reviewed, meaning that in order to get this article accepted for publication, other scientists are going to scrutinize it, make corrections, and maybe even reject it. In fact, some of the top journals have rejection rates of over 70 to 95%. So it can be very hard to get your uh, article published. The other thing is that the journals can be very general, like Nature or Science, but some are also very, very specific. Here we have the Journal of Cleft Palate Research that just looks at you know, cranial facial disorders and cleft palate and how to repair it. And I remember going to my, my college library years ago and seeing just rows and rows of these issues and, and of this journal. And I was like, how are they able to publish so many different articles on one like minute thing? But apparently they are. Okay, the other thing about journals is they tend to be very technical. They use a lot of jargon language in there, and it's very hard for somebody that's not trained in that particular field oftentimes to understand what they're talking about. As a result, they can often be very boring. I do not expect you to like open up a scientific journal, sit on the toilet, and read it from front to back. In fact, most scientists wouldn't do that unless they're really weird. Uh, but the interesting thing about scientific journals is they are a cookbook. Uh, a tenet of science is that we have to put the materials and methods in there. We have to tell people how we did our experiment, how we came to our conclusions, so that other scientists, if they're skeptical of that, can redo the experiment and see if they come out with the same results. Now, these days it's hard to figure out what's a real journal and what's not. All these are real journals, by the way. But if you ever want to know what a real journal is, or if somebody gives you a journal and you want to know how popular it is or how much it's cited, just go up and Google something called the impact factor. And the impact factor basically tells you how often articles in that journal are cited by other scientists. If you find that somebody gives you a journal and you can't find an impact factor for it, that's pretty telling as well. Okay, so primary literature, again, was where the scientists published their uh, primary findings, their initial findings from their experiments. And then that can be distilled down to something called secondary literature, which are like monographs and reviews. Uh, and then we have something called tertiary literature. Now, as a student, this is probably where you're reading down here. So you're reading your textbook is a good example of tertiary literature. All three of these types of literature can be good references, but more likely than not, you're going to be conducting uh, or consulting tertiary literature when you look up information for class. Okay. Now, there's also popular literature, which is probably another type of tertiary literature. And it summarizes scientific findings in a way that is understandable to the everyday Joe in the public. So understandable to the public. Uh, most of these are not peer-reviewed, so unlike 
primary literature, which is peer-reviewed, a lot of popular literature is not. But reputable publications like Newsweek or something like that are going to have a science editor or at least somebody with a science degree that will scrutinize that article and if they're really good, they'll go back and contact the scientists they're writing about and say, hey, did my article get this right? Did I, do I understand you correctly? So there are reputable uh, popular sources and there's non-reputable sources as well. Okay, so as an activity in class or at least online, I'm going to have you look at probably a dozen different publications and I want you to figure out which are reputable sources of scientific information and which are maybe not so reputable. So be looking for an announcement in class and uh, if we have time to actually work face to face, we'll actually sit down and look at 12 or 15 publications and sort of rate them on believability. Okay, so here are some examples of reputable popular literature sources, things like Time, Newsweek, Discover. Nobody really buys these at the newsstand anymore, but you can still get a subscription online. Most uh, newspapers, most uh, major newspapers are also good sources of scientific information because the Associated Press does a very good job of covering science. Government websites are generally pretty good, uh, as are academic textbooks. So these are solid sources to go to to find out scientific information without going to a journal, which can be very boring to read. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about the case study given in your textbook. And this was called To Give a Shot or Not. And basically it talks about Samantha and her husband who have recently welcomed a new child into their life. We'll call that child Cletus. And it's getting around six months of age around this time, around the time they would normally be vaccinated for measles, mumps, and rubella. So the question is, should they give Cletus the vaccine? Well, it depends on who you talk to. If they're good parents, they're of course going to go talk to their pediatrician. And their pediatrician is going to tell them, yes, you should vaccinate Cletus. It's around the right time, six months. Uh, measles is a very virulent disease. It spreads very rapidly. There are some very bad side effects that are accompanied uh, with having measles, and you don't want them to get it. So by all means, vaccinate your child. It will not only protect them, but protect others in the population. And they can provide evidence for you of the safety and efficacy of that vaccine using information from scientific studies, information on government websites like the CDC website. So that's the information they're going to give you. And you're going to go home after that event and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to Google MMR vaccine dangers. And when you do, things are always going to open up on the internet. There's always evidence to the contrary. So you'll probably come across an anti-vaxxer website and there's a lot of anti-vaxxers out there still, and one of the most prominent ones in the last 15 or 20 years uh, has been Jenny McCarthy. Now, Jenny McCarthy was a former actress that later turned activist uh, when her son was diagnosed with autism, and she had linked it, she thought, in her mind, to the MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And as evidence, she'll point to this paper right here, which was a scientific paper published in a reputable scientific journal that drew the wrong conclusions. So this was by Dr. Andrew Wakefield, and initially uh, suggested a link between uh, inoculation with the MMR vaccine and later coming down with um, uh, autism and other type of disorders. He only studied tw 12 children, and as it turns out, he falsified a lot of his data. He later was, uh, had the, uh, the article retracted, and he also lost his medical license as a result of fraud. So despite the fact that this paper was roundly rejected, uh, people still cling to it now and won't vaccinate their children, which is kind of scary. So it's all about who are you going to believe, and that's what we're talking about today. Okay, this kind of situation has played itself out more recently here in Hawaii and also in Western Samoa. So last year, around Christmas time, uh, there was this outbreak of uh, measles in Western Samoa as a result of people not being vaccinated. Now, the reason the kids didn't get vaccinated was there was some reactions, some vaccines that were given in the wrong dose or had the other medications mixed with it. But suffice it to say, there was two adverse reactions and then people stopped vaccinating and then vaccination was very low anyway. And as a result, we had this huge measles epidemic in which I think over 5,000 people got sick and I think what did we say over 50 or so died, uh, many of them children. And Part of this problem is there was somebody out there that was actually telling people, don't vaccinate your children, your immunity can fight it off, etc. So there's always people you're gonna find that are saying, no, no, this is not the way it goes. Believe me, don't believe science. Well, believe science. Okay, so today we're talking about how to be a critical thinker and evaluate scientific claims. First of all, if somebody makes a claim to you, ask yourself if the claim seems credible. 
That is, does it seem too good be, to be true? If it does, it probably is too good to be true. Secondly, ask yourself, what is the source of the claim? What kind of publication is it coming from? Is it just coming from somebody's word of mouth? Is it coming from a YouTube video? Or is it coming from the CDC or uh, other government websites? Okay. What evidence is presented? Do they present graphs? Do they have data? Uh, they have other medical studies they're linking to? And finally, is the speaker a qualified authority? Now, this is a double-edged sword. Um, your Uncle Buck is probably not a qualified authority unless he's a uh, you know, physician or something like that to talk about health. Uh, but at the same time, we can also have physicians that are ostensibly qualified but sometimes speak out of turn. So be aware of that, too. Is the speaker being paid? Uh, are they receiving compensation for making a claim? Uh, do they have any or claim unique knowledge? This is very important. If you go on the Internet, and it'll be like, the top 10 things about this or that that your physician doesn't want to know. Well, if somebody starts out a line like that, you can basically guarantee that whatever they're going to tell you next is a bunch of hooey, so don't believe it. And finally, does the speaker use strong emotions to make their case? When uh, the two parents went to talk to their pediatrician about whether or not they should vaccinate their child, the pediatrician was probably very measured and said, yes, measles is a very, uh, very bad disease. You don't want to get it. It's important that you vaccinate your child, please. But that's probably the extent of the emotion that you'll get from there. As opposed to if you go to an anti-vaxxer website or something like that, there might be tears, there might be anger and stuff like that. And as a human being, it's hard not to buy into that. But be aware that if you use a lot of strong emotions in there, oftentimes people use that to cover up for a lack of data or a lack of credibility. And finally, this is the most important thing, is is there outside evidence to support the claim the person is making? Uh, or do they just support it based on their own uh, knowledge? So be aware of that. Okay, there's also other rubrics you can consult as well. This is the CRAPE rubric. It doesn't spell crap. There's two A's in there. But it talks about, you know, evaluate the information. Is it current? Or is this something that's been circulating on the Internet for the last 10 years? Uh, is it relevant? Is the information relevant to what we're talking about? Is the person making the claim an authority? Are they a doctor? Are they a physician? Uh, are they a researcher? Um, a, is the information accurate? And P, what is the purpose of the information they're providing? Even scientists, even physicians sometimes can have uh, ulterior motives for presenting information. Usually not in their office as being uh, your primary physician, but if you see a physician on TV and they're speaking on the Oprah Winfrey show, be aware that they might be speaking a little bit out of turn in some cases. Case in point here, we have Dr. Mehmet Oz, who came to us from the uh, Oprah Winfrey show, and he's been around for at least 10 years, I think now, and he was a cardiothoracic surgeon, very, very accomplished, uh, published uh, several uh, research papers, but then, uh, due to Oprah, sort of launched his own television career with a Dr. Mehmet Oz show, and uh, began sort of hawking all these herbal health cures and stuff like that. And it got so ridiculous uh, that some of the claims that he was making about uh, these things is that, you know, he actually had to go before a Senate subcommittee and explain uh, why he was being so fraudulent and, and the claims that he was making. So be aware that even though he was a very accomplished physician, once he took a turn to the TV, uh, he basically lost a lot of his credibility and, and began to, uh, I guess, work towards the audience rather than work towards uh, people's best interest in terms of health. So, okay, now we want to talk about looking at some specific claims and evaluating them for uh, whether or not we think they're true. So this is one I found on the internet a long time ago, and it has to do with something called Karktal. So as you can read, Karktal is a thoroughly researched herbal cancer therapy produced from natural herbs made into powerful herbal, herbal dietary supplement. Um, it is safe and harmless. Karktal treats all types of cancer, including cancer of the esophagus, ear, throat, nose, brain, breast, lymphoma, lungs, blood, kidney, stomach, colorectal, pancreas, and hepatobiliary cancer. Wow, that's a mouthful. So first of all, the first thing that gets me here is, does this claim seem credible? I mean, all this information right here, you think it's going to cure all these different cancers and it's just available online? Um, probably not. So that doesn't pass the sniff test. Take a look at the website. Well, this is coming from a .com website, herbscancure.com. They're trying to sell you something. Uh, so I would be very, very wary of it. It doesn't even say who the speaker is. It's just this nebulous website. So yeah, I'll pass on the Karktal. Okay, that brings us up to something that most people don't realize is that there is a difference between a drug and a supplement. 
Now, you get drugs at the drugstore. They're often prescribed to you, but there's also non-prescription drugs. So drugs are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and in order to get those drugs approved, they have to go through rigorous clinical trials, and the results of these clinical trials are usually published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. So in order to be approved by the FDA, um, the people running the study must prove two things. One, safety, is it safe? And two, effectiveness or efficacy, is it effective? Does it actually do what it says it's gonna do? Now, in order to do this, on average, uh, most clinical trials are gonna run upwards of $500 million in cost. So it takes a lot of money and effort to bring a drug uh, or a potential drug uh, through all these steps in order to be able to say, yes, this drug does this and be certified by the FDA. Now, on the other hand, supplements are a little bit different. Supplements, for the most part, are not regulated by the FDA unless we know there's a problem. Okay, few have been investigated in rigorous clinical studies, and as a result, we really don't know anything about the safety or efficacy. So dietary supplements have had this incredible growth in the last 20 years as a result of the restrictions sort of being loosened about what people can say about supplements and selling them and advertise them. So on average, at least half of the population is taking supplements, and so supplements are things like vitamins, which are healthy, right? Yeah. They're probably not unhealthy, but we're not sure how much benefit you get out of some vitamins. Uh, but we all tend to take something at some time or another that's not actually a drug, but is a supplement. Okay, so here is a supplement that some people take called echinacea. And the claim for echinacea, depending on the website, is that it activates the body's immune system, increasing the chances of fighting off disease, and it is a potent herb uh, that can help ward off the common cold. So here is the source for that information. So as part of today's work, I'm actually gonna assign you to read the abstract of a scientific paper which actually looked at echinacea. And as a result of just reading the abstract, which is the first part, I want you to tell me two things. One, is the drug safe? And two, is it effective? So you don't have to read the whole paper, you just have to read the abstract and tell me whether it's safe or it's effective. Now, if we do this in class, we'll do it in class. If not, I'll post it on announcements, and then you will have to upload your response to the forums or the discussion board. Okay, second drug we're gonna look at, sorry, second supplement, is something called Mua Huang, otherwise known as ephedra. So the claim with ephedra is, ephedra is a powerful stimulant that can boost one's metabolic rate, increasing the rate in which calories are burned by the body, along with acting as an appetite suppressant. So Mua Huang was a very popular um, sort of uh, two-part uh, supplement that was taken in the 90s, and I think it was banned finally in 2004. Uh, so you don't even have to read it right now. I can tell you that they did find that it was very effective at causing weight loss. It's a very powerful stimulant, but they also found that it wasn't very safe. Uh, so as a result, uh, it was pulled and banned in the country as of, I think, 2004. And that was a result of several high profile deaths, among them many athletes that were taking it as a stimulant, and then they go outside, they exert themselves, and all of a sudden they have to go into cardiac arrest. So this was a, a supplement that did turn out to be very effective in causing weight loss, but it also was deemed not to be safe for people to take. Okay, so why do people take supplements if we don't know necessarily anything about their safety or efficacy? Well, one reason is the placebo effect. Remember we said before that a placebo was sort of a sham treatment that we give people in a medical trial so they don't know whether they're getting the real treatment, let's say the aspirin, or the sham treatment. So the reason we do this is to determine whether or not the actual experimental drug has an effect. Because anytime we give somebody something and say this might have an effect, they sort of can get a psychological or even physical benefit just from thinking they're taking something that's gonna help them. And that's called the placebo effect. And so we try to control for the placebo effect in scientific studies, but it's also one of the reasons why you might go to the doctor you know, with a viral infection, which usually we can't treat with any types of antibiotics or something like that, but they might give you some kind of pill. If you're feeling really bad, they might give you some zinc or a supplement or an iron or something like that, just as placebo effect. So you can take something, so you can do something and feel a little bit better about just doing something. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about pseudoscience and other misuses of science. So what does the word pseudo mean? You probably already know that it means false. So pseudoscience is false science. It's a claim or belief 
or practice that is presented as scientific but doesn't really adhere to standards of, uh, or methods of science. So here is just a list of three examples. We have astrology, which is basically you know, looking at the stars and be able to predict what's going to happen with your life. Uh, homeopathy, which is, you know, you can read about that, taking a small amount of something that normally makes you sick, putting it in a solution, that'll make you better. And then things like chelation therapy. So if you go onto Wikipedia and just search for pseudoscience, you will find a very, very, very large a list of pseudoscience disciplines. And I'm not saying Wikipedia is always right or anything like that, but they do have a very large list. And probably you look on there and some of the things that you thought were scientific are probably pseudoscience. And so here are some examples in history, something called phrenology, which basically said we could predict people's mental abilities by feeling the bumps on their head and measuring those bumps because we thought different brain regions, you know, if they're larger here, they will have better cognitive ability and so forth. And this was a bunch of hooey. Basically, more recently, we've had something among my own students in the last 20 years was something called uh, colon hydrotherapy. I remember being a new instructor and they came in and said, oh, Dr. Langston, you ought to try the colon cleanse, the colon hydrotherapy. And I was like, do you mean an enema? And they said, sure, sure, you know, rinses out all the bad toxins and things like that and increases your mood, does all this stuff. And as it turns out, there are reasons to give enemas and to rinse one's colons uh, medically, but there's really no benefit perceived uh, by having your colon regularly washed out. Uh, but still, on Hawaii, if you go Google, uh, colon hydrotherapy, and you'll pull up at least five or six places on Google Maps where you can get that done, so have at it. Another scientific claim that came up in the past five or ten years as I was an instructor is one of my students was trying to sell me some structured water, and I never heard about this before, but as it turns out, you can buy this device, and I don't know if it has a magnet in it or something like that, but Theoretically, it arranges the water molecules in, uh, in a certain sequence so that they're more healthful and beneficial when you consume them and drink them. Well, this is just hooey from the outset. Anybody that's taken chemistry knows anything about uh, hydrogen bonding and covalent bonding knows that you know, water molecules are continuously uh, forming and breaking these hydrogen bonds at thousands of times uh, per second, and there's no way to structurally order water other than freezing it. But be aware you can go out there and find several websites that will sell you this pseudoscience of structured water. Okay, now we're going to shift gears and talk about other misuses of science. Uh, and one thing is called the correlation causation fallacy. And basically that happens when we look at two data variables that seem to be tracking one another and incorrectly invoke a this causes that association, which is not always the case. So here's one that is fanciful, it's made up, uh, but some of the data on here are real. So here we have a graph on the uh, x-axis, the horizontal axis, we have years going from what is about 1800 all the way up to 2000. And on the leftmost y-axis we have uh, global temperature. And on the rightmost y-axis we have number of pirates. So if you look at the red line first, that's showing that over time global temperature has been increasing from the 1800s all the way through the 2000s. Now as scientists, we know this. We have been measuring it for a long time and we know indeed uh, the temperature of the atmosphere and the oceans has been increasing. Now, we can accept that. Let's look at the second line down here, which is the blue line, and it's showing the number of pirates here. Now these aren't real data, or just trying to make a point. That we can probably accept that the number of pirates has decreased from the 1700s to the 1800s, the 1900s, the 2000s. Probably is the case. So if we see that the pirates have decreased and the temperature has increased, we could incorrectly draw a cause and effect relationship. Well, global warming has really screwed over the pirates and that we don't have as much pirate work for them to do as a result of global warming. Well, that's not the case. You know, there's probably a third variable in here accounting for both of these. What caused the temperature to go up? Well, the Industrial Revolution, which happened back in the late 1700s and the 1800s, and that caused more carbon dioxide and then caused the rise in, uh, in world heat. By the same token, as the economy changes due to uh, the Industrial Rev Revolution, there's probably less cause or less need for pirates, and probably it's harder to be a pirate. Who knows? Again, this is just giving you an example of an incorrect uh, cause and effect relationship. Here's one that really did happen. So this is nightlight use versus myopia. So everybody knows what a nightlight is, right? You put it in your baby's room, so when you come in there, you can move things around and put the pacifier back in their mouth. Well, there was a study that found out that children that were raised with nightlights 
or even worse, children that were just raised with the lights on for their first two years were more likely to be myopic. That is, uh, they had bad vision, they were nearsighted, and need corrective lenses. And so here you can see the data that was based on this actual study, which was published in Nature. You can see that you know, about 10% of the kids that uh, were raised without light needed corrective lenses. About, what is that, 30% uh, that were raised with a nightlight needed corrective lenses. And over 50% of the ones that were raised with the lights on needed corrective lenses. So this was a really startling effect, and people said, oh my gosh, we need to turn out these lights. And it was published in a scientific journal. As it turns out, it wasn't really the light that was the effect of it. Most of the time, uh, eye problems are inherited, and myopia doesn't actually manifest itself until the kid is 12 or so years old. What was happening here is that the parents that were myopic, that had bad eyesight, were more likely to leave the lights on uh, in their child's room so they could you know, walk around in there and they wouldn't bump around when they were putting the pacifier in or changing the diaper, just checking to see if they were okay. Whereas those parents that had really great vision were fine with leaving the lights off. Well, snap forward 15 years when that child uh, comes time for corrective lenses. If their parents were myopic, chances are due to genetics, they're myopic as well. But this study incorrectly drew the association that it was the light that was causing the myopia, not the genes. Okay, so the take home message for today is to trust science as a collective process for finding the truth, but don't be afraid to be skeptical of individual scientists or others that make outrageous claims. Uh, even if you have one scientific paper that comes out and seems to say something totally different than the other ones, be interested in it, but just realize that sometimes people do get stuff wrong. And always evaluate would-be scientific claims by consulting multiple reputable resources uh, for information and use that critical thinking and crap rubric 